Hey everybody, Dr. O here, and welcome to Unit 9, the unit on the urinary system. So one of the things that we want to do is we want to start out by getting some definitions in place. And so one of those definitions is the word excretion. Excretion means that we're going to be removing waste from the body. That's what excretion is. Elimination is that we are discharging the waste from the body. So uh, elimination includes micturation um, or urination. Those terms can be used interchangeably. Um, <clears throat> I think micturation is a little bit older, an older term, but um, yeah, just so that you know both of those terms are out there. So when we talk about the urinary system, what sort of homeostatic regulation are, is going to be involved here? Well, it has to do uh, with what's happening with our blood plasma volume. That is essential in the body because our blood plasma volume is going to drive blood pressure. So that's a, a very important component that gets maintained and the, the, uh, in the body, that, that, that fluid volume. The other thing that becomes really important is solute concentration because of osmosis. Solute concentration can either drive fluid into our body cells or draw it out of the body cells. So this is something that uh, these two things are really important when it comes to the urinary system. So um, our urinary system then is going to regulate blood volume, which will play a huge role in maintaining blood pressure. It's going to play a role in maintaining solute concentration, which means our ions are going to be regulated largely by the, the urinary system. Some of those ions are going to be those positively charged uh, hydrogen ions, which will drive pH levels. It also uh, deals with the bicarbonate ion, which is the ion that the blood uses as a buffer system. So the kidneys will be dealing with both of those, and that can have an effect on pH. And it says that it conserves valuable nutrients, and we're going to look at specifically where that's happening, because that does happen in a specific part of the filtration un unit, which is known as the nephron. With regards to the macroscopic structures, the large structures, gross anatomy structures of the urinary system, there's only four. You've got the kidneys, you've got the tube that attaches the kidney to the bladder, which is called the ureters, you have the urinary bladder, and then you have the uh, passageway away from the bladder to the outside world, which is known as the urethra. So generally we can say that the kidneys are filtering the, the fluid out from the blood, filtering the blood, and are, in, are creating uh, the urine, and the ureters are a passageway for delivering the urine from the kidneys down to the bladder. Bladder is the holding tank, and the urethra will transport the urine out of the body. Now the kidneys are considered to be a major excretory organ, which means that they remove a lot of garbage from our body. <laughs> That's basically it. So there's a few organs in the body that are classified as filtration organs, and certainly the kidney is one of them. And because the kidney is so intimately tied with the blood, it's going to be in charge of a number of, of things, some of which might surprise you. i uh, got a little list here that we're going to go through. So some of this is going to be a repeat from a previous slide or two. Some of it will be some uh, repeat from other units, and some of it may actually be new information. So what is the what are the kidneys doing for us? Well, we know they're regulating total, total water volume and solute concentration of our water. We just talked a little bit about that regulating ion concentrations in extracellular fluid. Now, extracellular fluid means blood plasma, predominantly, uh, interstitial spaces because of the exchanges that it's happening in those areas with the blood, um, and possibly even with lymph because what is, what is lymph made from except basically blood? So yeah, it's going to play a role in what's happening around the tissues. It's going to, uh, the kidneys ensure our long-term acid-base balance. So in uh, dealing with our ions, it, the kidneys will deal with hydrogen ions as well as those bicarbonate ions, and those will have a huge influence on pH balance in the body. Um, they, uh, the kidneys are responsible for excreting these metabolic wastes that we don't want in the body, the things that it basically um, eliminated previously uh, from the blood, pull these things out of the blood. 
uh, it's also responsible for producing erythropoietin. Erythropoietin, which is going to regulate uh, the production of red blood cells. Now, why would that be the case? Well, the kidneys are filtering the blood. Kidneys are intimately aware of what's happening with the blood. They know everything. They know everything. They're looking at oxygen levels. They're looking at uh, blood pressure. They're looking at uh, ion concentrations. So the kidneys, and the kidneys actually can regulate the maintenance of these things on their own. They don't need the brain to do it. They're not looking for input from other body systems necessarily to run some of this stuff. So the kidneys, kidneys have a little bit of say, a little bit of managerial authority at the level of the kidney with the movement of certain things around. So yeah, the kidneys are going to uh, release erythropoietin when they detect that there's low blood oxygen levels. And they think, the kidneys think that this is because there's not enough red blood cells. So erythropoietin gets released. If blood pressure should drop, the kidneys will release the enzyme renin which will trigger the release, ultimately the release of aldosterone, which will help um, pull fluid out of the kidneys and return it back into the bloodstream. So yeah, the kidneys producing these two, <clears throat> these two um, uh, communicating molecules that play a big role in managing the blood itself. The kidneys also activate vitamin D. We need vitamin D for calcium levels, to maintain calcium levels in the blood. And the kidneys, if, they, if we need for them to, can actually carry out gluconeogenesis. So kidneys are pretty amazing when we consider all the things that they're doing for us. So of course we have to give you an uh, image of the kidney and uh, parts that are labeled and everything. But the thing I want to point out on this image is the location of the kidneys with regard to the aorta, the abdominal aorta. In fact, the uh, renal artery is a branch off of the aorta. And then um, <clears throat> the inferior vena cava because the renal vein attaches to that as well. The other thing I want to point out is that in order to view the, the kidneys, the ureters, bladder, and uh, we can't even see the, the urethra, but to look at the kidneys in the abdomen, we have to remove all of the organs that are in the peritoneum. So we have to remove everything that has, a, has that uh, visceral parietal uh, peritoneum to it. So we have to remove the stomach, the liver, um, pancreas. Uh, all the intestines, get all of those things out, although all the, not all the intestines are in the peritoneum, some of them are retroperitoneal. And that's my point, is that the kidneys are actually behind the abdominal cavity, because the abdominal cavity is bounded by the peritoneum. So kidneys are classified as retroperitoneal. So as I said, the kidneys are behind the abdominal cavity, which means that they are retroperitoneal. They're going to be located in the lower thoracic upper lumbar region. And I have listed here some, um, some landmarks with regard to the, the spine. Here I say the, the 12th thoracic vertebra, maybe down as low as the f uh, 5th lumbar vertebra. I have also seen uh, it listed as the 10th thoracic vertebra as low as the third lumbar vertebra. So I'm going to say that if your lecture or your information with your program has a different level listed, know that level because there, there is some variability between people. And it seems to me personally that I think L5 is a little bit low. I, t I have a tendency to believe that, the, that it, it's more common to find the kidneys tucked up underneath the floating ribs uh, in the thoracic cage. So they're gonna get some protection from those floating ribs. So that means they're gonna be somewhere around at least at least thoracic uh, vertebra 11 and 12, and then um, uh, have the kidneys extend a little bit into the upper thoracic, uh, upper lumbars. Um, so that's not an uncommon presentation. But you expect the kidneys to have a little bit of protection from the rib cage because they are important. All right. The right kidney is um, is crowned by the liver, so basically it's 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 going to be um, up kind of below the, the liver, and because the liver is a real estate hog in the abdominal cavity, it means that the, the right kidney is going to sit a little bit lower than the left one. So the left one sits higher, the right one sits lower. On top of the kidneys are the suprarenal glands, also known as the adrenal glands, because the kidneys are the renal glands. Um, and 
if we look at the kidneys, we're going to know that laterally there's a convex surface faces the outside of the body, and that there's medially going to be a concave surface. And this is where we're going to see the attachment of the ureters, and it's also going to be the entry and exit point for blood vessels, lymphatics, um, nerves. And that area where you have this, these vessels entering and exiting the kidneys is known as the renal hilum. Okay. Now, whenever you can cut an organ open and look at it and see that there is a distinct outer region and a distinct inner region, we're going to say that, that that organ has a cortex and a medulla, and that's certainly true with a kidney. So in the renal cortex, what we're going to see are these uh, uh, just kind of a grainy looking outer region. Now, the renal medulla has a lot more um, structures to it, um, and this is going to be the one that's uh, a little closer to the hilum. The, the medulla is closer to the hilum. And one of the things that we're going to find in there are these pyramids, these cone-shaped structures that we're going to call renal pyramids. And their broad base is going to face the cortex, which is going to be on the lateral aspect of the kidney. Now, at the tip of each of the pyramids is going to be a little um, pochiati projection called a papilla. And that these papilla, uh, in fact, the points of the pyramids are going to point medially. We'll look at a picture, uh, but they're going to point medially, pointing towards where the hilum is. And um, in between these pyramids is going to be some tissue that is basically like an extension from the cortex, and we call those renal columns. And uh, anatomists, you know, they have to label everything. Uh, they would call the renal pyramid and the column that separates it from its adjoining pyramid a lobe. And most of our kidneys are going to have about eight lobes, maybe six to eight lobes per kidney. Now, between the renal cortex and the medulla, this is these are the two areas where we're going to be making and moving the urine. And ultimately, we have to collect all that urine. So our, our renal pyramids are going to um, drain into a series of collecting areas. And I'm going to start by talking about the minor calyx or the minor calluses. This is going to be a cup-shaped area that's going to collect the urine that is draining from a, 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 a uh, pyramidal or pyramidal um, papilla. So each, at the end of each uh, uh, pyramid where that papilla is, there's going to be a little collecting area. So it's an open area and it's called a minor calyx, or if we're talking about all of them, minor calluses. <clears throat> now the minor calluses are going to drain into a couple of um, larger areas, which are called major calluses. And then ultimately, the, the, the two or three major calluses that are going to be in the, the kidney are going to drain into the renal pelvis. Right? So the flow of urine is going to go from the pyramid into a minor calyx, into a major calyx, into the pelvis, and then ultimately to the ureter. And I would know that information just like that. So here's our image. Uh, and we can see the artist has given us some really nice detail here. This outer region right here on the lateral aspect of the kidney, this is going to be the cortex. And then if we look in the inner region, the medulla, we see that we've got these uh, pyramids right here. So there's one, there's one, there's another one. In between the pyramids, we're going to have this bit of cortex that's dipping in, and that's going to be a column. At the tip of each pyramid is going to be a papilla. Papilla here, papilla there. And each papilla has a little open area where it's going to drain its urine, and that's going to be a minor calyx. And then a major calyx is right here, so it's going to be receiving urine from maybe these three pyramids right here, these three minor calyces, and maybe this uh, one over here is collecting from these three, and then together they're all going to drain into the renal pelvis, which is this larger open area that is going to be attached to the ureter right there.
And we can see that the ureter <clears throat> and the blood vessels, and we can also assume the nerves and lymphatics, are also all in this area, which is going to be known as the hilum. So this region right here is a hilum, and the structures that are in that region are going to be blood vessels, nerves, lymphatics, and we're also going to find our buddy, the ureter there. Now, because the kidneys are filtering the blood, it would behoove us to learn how blood actually makes its way through the kidneys. So that's what we're going to talk about here, and then we'll look at a picture. So first of all, blood's going to make its way to the kidneys by way of the renal arteries. And the renal arteries are going to be delivering about a quarter of the cardiac output to the kidneys each minute. So the kidneys, the kidneys are intimately uh, involved with our blood. They know what's going on with the blood all the time. So the arterial flow through the kidneys is going to start off with the renal artery. The renal artery will uh, immediately branch once it is inside the kidney and it will create the segmental arteries. Those are going to branch and go into the, the renal columns between the pyramids and those are called the interlobar arteries. Then the lobar arteries are going to branch and they're going to travel around the curved part. So we're moving from medial to lateral uh, through the kidney and they're going to travel along that curved outer part. Uh, the arcuates are going to travel along the outer uh, curved part that runs between the medulla of the kidney and the cortex of the kidney. The arcuates are going to do that. Okay, so I like to remember the arcuates arc around the lateral aspect because it is curved. And then the arcuates are going to have a branch that are going to, uh, and these branches will penetrate into the cortex. And these arteries have two names. Um, uh, they're called the radial, uh, the cortical radiates because they're radiating into the cortex, but they're also called the interlobular. Now I'm going to point it out that we have interlobular here. It's a smaller vessel, uh, might even be getting into the territory of arterial. But then we have the interlobar, which are the ones that are running in between the lobes in the medulla. So be mindful that we have two very similar words here and you need to know where those are located. All right, so once blood has left the, radi the cortical radiate or the interlobular um, artery, it's going to feed into the filtration uh, uh, unit of the kidney, which is known as the nephron. We haven't talked about that yet, but we will. And then when blood is making its return pathway back, it's going to basically follow the, the same passage as it took to get there with one variation, and I'll tell you that one variation when we get to it. So then that means that our blood is going to leave our little nephron, our functional unit of filtration. It's going to enter into a cortical radiate vein. It'll travel between that arc in the, uh, at the edge of the medulla and the cortex, the arcuate vein. And then it'll go through the column in between the lobes known as the interlobar lobar vein. And then where we had a segmental artery right here, no segmental vein. That is the deviation point. So instead we go from the interlobar and the interlobars will merge and create the renal vein. And that's it. I would know that passageway of blood vessels to and from. So here's our image. Let's take a look here. So we're going to start off with our renal artery. It's going to come in at the hilum and then it'll branch immediately into the segmentals. And then the segmentals are going to feed the interlobar. So here we have interlobars going in between the lobes. And then the lobar, interlobars are going to branch and create these arcuates, which are going to go around the lateral aspect between the medulla and the cortex. They're going to arc around. And then we can see these little tiny branches coming off of that, and those are the, the cortical radiates, also known as the interlobular. It's not listed on this slide, but you'll want to make note of that. And then from the interlobulars, aka the cortical radiate arteries, um, they'll go through the nephrons, and then they're going to make their way back through starting with a cortical radiate um, also known as an interlobular vein, and then through an arcuate vein, and then into an interlobar vein, and then into the renal vein. No segmental. 
So I know we just got through talking about the digestive system a little bit ago, and pretty much whenever we are in a system where I talk about tubes, I say Mother Nature makes tubes about the same regardless of where that tube is. There's going to be variations depending upon need, but largely um, any tube in the body, including the ureter, is going to have an inner covering, so it'll have some sort of a mucosal covering, and then there'll be a little bit of a muscle layer in there, and then there'll be some sort of outer covering. There might be an, an additional layer. There may be some special features. If it's really, really tiny, some of those uh, layers might be missing, but basically every tube in the body is going to have those three layers, and the ureter is no different, and we are going to look at that. Um, the ureters are uh, attached to the kidneys, down to the bladder. All of that's going to be retroperitoneal. And interestingly enough, where the ureters attached to the bladder might not be at the top where we might think it makes sense, you know, gravity fed and all that. But instead, <laughs> there's a whole reason why uh, it's not gravity fed. Uh, but instead, the ureters are going to attach to the bottom of the bladder in back. So yeah, at the bottom, not at the top. Now you might be thinking, well, gee, if the bladder starts to fill up with fluid, isn't that going to mean that the fluid is going to backwash into the ureters? You might think that, but you know, Mother Nature, she thinks of everything. Um, there's not, it's not a true valve, not a true valve, but there is a mechanism between the ureter and the bladder wall so that when the bladder pressure starts to increase, it's going to cause the distal end of the ureter to close to prevent backwash of urine into, into the ureter. So there's some sort of a mechanism as the pressure increases and the bladder wall distends that the, the anatomy acts like a valve and it's going to force that, that fluid, um, uh, uh, force that, that connection closed. So fluid can still make its way in, but it can't make its way out. So there is like a built-in valve type mechanism there that stops that. So as I said earlier, there are three layers that are going to make up the ureter wall because that's what all tube-like structures are going to have. Maybe there's more. Might be less if it's too, super tiny, but we're not talking super tiny here. So let's take a look at what we got. So we're going to have a, a mucosa layer, which is going to be made up of that uh, transitional epithelium that is unique to the urinary system. It's a stratified tissue, but it has that weird expandability quality to it. So thanks, transitional epithelium. And then there's going to be a muscularis layer in here. So we've got a smooth muscle layer that is going to basically do peristalsis. So urine, contrary to what we might think, urine is not a gravity-fed uh, system. The movement of urine is not a gravity-fed system, uh, which is why we can float around in space and be just fine. So the fact that we can move urine from the kidneys down to the bladder, it happens by way of peristalsis. So, and uh, the rate of peristalsis is going to be adjusted based upon how much urine we're making. So if we're making a lot of urine, a lot of peristalsis. If we're not making very much, if any, then no peristalsis for you. All right, now because we are outside of the peritoneum, we're not going to have a, a, a serous membrane covering our ureters, but instead we're going to have that adventitia, which is a fibrous connective covering. So in this image, we've got the, like I said, this could have been the esophagus, <laughs> this could be a blood vessel, it could be virtually uh, a lot of things, but because what we see here is we've got an inner layer of uh, mucosa, and then we've got some sort of a muscular, muscular layer, and then we're going to have some sort of an outer covering here. The thing I want to point out is that this tube is very much like what we saw in the digestive tract, and we are going to have two layers of muscle. We're going to have a, um, a, a circular layer as well as a longitudinal layer. So those two layers are going to help propel um, the, the urine along in the ureter and um, do the peristalsis. All right, let's chat about the bladder. So the bladder is largely a muscular sac, and we use it for temporary storage of the urine. Um, it is retroperitoneal, except um, where the top of it is going to be covered um, with the peritoneum of the abdominal cavity. So it kind of makes contact at the top, but otherwise it's going to be covered with an adventitia. 
Um, it, it lies on the floor of the torso, pelvic floor, and is going to be posterior to the pubic bone. So it'll be behind the pubic symphysis. In the males, there's going to be a prostate that surrounds the urethra, and it lies just below the, the bladder. And in females, the, the bladder is going to be um, behind the pubic bone, but anterior to the vagina and the uterus. So it's, in, it's the structure that is largely in front. Now, when we look at the um, when we look at the, the bladder, a unique feature that we there's a couple of unique features that we see. One of them is on the floor of the bladder, and it's called the trigone. And what that is are the are the two openings for the ureters, because remember they're going to be on the bottom part of the bladder. And then of course we're going to have the urethra. And there's this interesting. Uh, area between those three openings is a little bit depressed in that area and it's thought to be an area where um, you could have <clears throat> the persistence of a subclinical infection so you have the patient who keeps getting bladder infections I mean there's a whole lot of reasons why that could happen but one of the reasons could be that uh, the previous infection never gets full, cleared up fully and this trigone area acts like a petri dish that can cultivate the bacteria that wasn't fully killed off from the previous round of antibiotics the bladder wall is not going to be too different than the ureters. We're going to have a mucosal lining, which is going to be transitional epithelium, and there's going to be a, a rather robust muscular lining here. Um, and the muscle that makes up the bladder wall is known as the detrusor muscle, and it actually contains three layers. You don't really need to know about those, but there is going to be an inner and outer longitudinal layer with a circular layer in the middle, uh, kind of like an Oreo cookie. <laughs> That helps you remember that. Um, but yeah, if you just remember the detrusor muscle makes up the bladder wall, then I think you will have your bases covered. And um, then there's going to be an outer uh, covering known as that uh, fibrous adventitia. So like I said, that's going to cover, the fibrous adventitia is going to cover the entire uh, bladder except for uh, one portion of the superior surface of the bladder where it is going to be covered by the peritoneum because it's going to be up against the peritoneal cavity. Now we know the purpose of the bladder is to hold urine and when it's not holding urine it can collapse very much like the stomach does. So it shouldn't come as a surprise then that if we look at the the wall, the internal wall of the bladder, it's going to have those little uh, accordion capability structures to collapse things called rugae. So yeah, we see rugae in the stomach, we see rugae in the bladder. Now the bladder doesn't like fold up completely. It actually collapses from the top down which is a little bit diff different than what the stomach does. But still, it's going to have rugae, and you'll see that in the image of the bladder when we actually look at a picture. Um, and when it expands, it's basically going to um, expand and fill and uh, rise superiorly, because like I said, it collapses from the top. It doesn't just fold up, it collapses from the top, and then it'll expand upwards when the, as the bladder starts to fill. Now, um, a moderately full bladder can hold about a pint of fluid, um, although it can hold twice that if necessary, but the problem with overfilling a bladder is that you can rupture a bladder. We don't have a lot of organs in the body that can do that, um, you know, because you're not moving stuff. I mean, the intestines can, uh, but usually people don't hold their bowels to the point where they will cause their intestines to explode. Um, the stomach, that doesn't usually happen. Lungs, you can't do it at all. Um, but you can hold bladder and continue to make more urine and then over extend and rupture your bladder. So just be mindful of that. All right, the last structure we're going to talk about is the urethra, and this is also a muscular tube that's going to drain the, the urine from the bladder, get it to the outside world, and it's going to be lined with epithelium, no surprise there, but we're going to see a little bit of a difference. So at the very first part of the urethra where it's attached to the bladder, we're going to see that transitional epithelium, and then we're going to have it com uh, convert into pseudo-stratified columnar epithelium, and then at the very end, no surprise, we're going to have stratified squamous epithelium. Because remember, all of our mucosal um, linings where they interface with the outside world are going to be, co uh, be covered with um, 
stratified squamous epithelium. We have that in the mouth. We now see this in the urethra. We learned about it in the anus. So hopefully not a surprise to you at this point. So similar to what we learned about the anus, there is going to be an internal sphincter and an external sphincter at the uh, urethral bladder uh, juncture that are going to that's that will help us hold in our urine and release it when we want to. So the internal urethral sphincter, very much like the the one that we learned about the anus, is going to be smooth muscle, and the external uh, sphincter is going to be voluntary muscle. Now, when it comes to urethras, they're not all created the same. And in the female, it's only going to be about three to four centimeters long, not very long, but it doesn't have a long way to go because the for the female, the bladder is just right there. At the, at the floor of the pelvis. Um, the urethra is going to be tightly bound to the anterior vaginal wall. At the external uh, urethral orifice, that's going to be the opening <clears throat> of the urethra, and we're going to see it um, anterior to the vaginal opening and then posterior to the clitoris. So it's just kind of in between there when you're looking at those, uh, looking at the floor of the pelvis. In the male, the urethra is going to play a role not only in the urinary system, but also in the reproductive system. So that means that the urethra is carrying uh, urine in the urinary system, but it's also carrying sperm in the reproductive system. And it's a much longer organ. It's the copulatory organ for the male. And as a result, it needs to, it, it needs to be longer. So when we talk about the male urethra, we talk about um, it with regard to regions and those regions are going to be associated with other organs or structures that we find in that area. So for example, the very first part of the male urethra is called the prostatic urethra because it actually pot passes through the prostate. It's found within the prostate as the urethra comes off of the bladder. So that's going to be the first inch or so of the male urethra, two and a half centimeters. Then it's going to pass through the floor of the of the pelvis, and we would call that part the membranous urethra. All right, so it's passing through the uh, urogenital diaphragm um, and uh, uh, you know whatever structures are also in within that area, the, the soft tissue, all that sort of stuff. And then we get to the part of the urethra that's going to be found within the penis, and this is called the spongy urethra. Now, you might be thinking, why isn't it called the penile urethra? Well, it's because the urethra runs through a special organ found in the penis known as the corpus spongiosum. It literally translates into the spongy body. And the purpose of this spongy body is to keep the urethra open when the male, is, uh, when the male has an erection. Because, um, as I've said so many times, the body only has so much real estate. Um, where things can expand into. And when the male has an erection, certainly the, the, the penis is going to elongate, but it'll also become larger diameter. And that's due to a couple of other specialized structures that are going to fill with blood and, and in order to allow the male to maintain the erection. And the thing that you don't want to have happen when, when you have this swelling occurring in the, in, the, in the penis is for the urethra to close off. You want the urethra to be able to stay open. So the spongy body that wraps around the urethra is capable of absorbing the, uh, the pressure of the two other organs that are filled with blood while also allowing the urethra to stay open. And that's why we call it the spongy urethra because it's, it's found within this, this special tissue that's known as this um, corpus spongiosum. So here we're looking at the male bladder, and uh, let's see, let's start off by talking about ureters. So ureter on our left, ureter on our right is going to have its attachment down on the posterior aspect of the bladder floor. So here they are right there. And then more anteriorly, we're going to have the opening of the urethra. And within these three openings, we're going to have that trigone, that little bit of a depression think that can act as a, a petri dish for cultivating bacteria. Not good. The other thing we'll notice is that we have rugae in the wall here, the mucosal lining of our bladder, um, made up of the detrusor muscle. We don't have to differentiate the layers that we have here, but just generally know detrusor muscle. 
uh, when we get into the urethra, we can see we've got a few areas where the urethra is passing through in the male. The first one is going to be the prostate, so this little bit right through here is the prostatic urethra. And then it passes through the floor of the pelvic uh, diaphragm, which is known as the uh, urogenital diaphragm, and we're going to be um, in the membranous urethra in this region. And then we get into the spongy urethra because it is passing through that special tissue known as the corpus spongiosum. Now, uh, and we can see flanking here in the penis, we have the erectile tissue. It's not labeled here, but I'll tell you that the two erectile um, areas left and right, each one is known as the corpus uh, cavernosum. Together, they're known as the capora cavernosa. Cavernosa. All right, let's talk about these sphincters. So you'll notice here at the floor of the bladder before we get into the ure ureter, excuse me, the urethra, <laughs> urethra, that we've got our internal sphincter, and it's not until we get into the floor of the uh, torso, the of the pelvis, that we actually see our external sphincter. It's going to be a little bit different in the female. These are going to be these two sphincters can be much closer together, but in the male they're going to be separated by the prostate. So let's go over the female bladder. So here we have ureter to the left, ureter to the right. Uh, they attach on the floor posteriorly, and then we have the anterior opening to the urethra, and we have the trigone. We see rugae. We see the detrusor muscle that makes up the bladder wall. We see the peritoneal covering on the top. And we can see that uh, we've got a very short urethra. Here we have the internal urethral sphincter, just like we saw with the male, but then the, the external in the female is, is really close to it because we don't have any, anything separating the internal and the external, such as a prostate. <laughs> so those two uh, sphincters are very close together in the, in the female. And then we have the opening, the external urethral orifice. Sometimes it's called the meatus, the urethral meatus. You might, you might see that in your readings. In the nephron a time or two and here we are we're going to talk about that so the nephron is the structural and the functional unit of the kidney that's in charge of doing the thing we think about the kidney doing which is making urine it's these guys right here um, and these are microscopic structures we have about a million or more per kidney so you got about two million if you happen to have two kidneys and there's two distinct parts to it First of all, we have the renal corpuscle, which is the very first part of it, and then attached to that is this little tube called a tubule, and then we have the tubule system that is, uh, is the rest of it. So let's take a look at that. All right, so here we have our little nephron, and here's our renal corpuscle, this very first part. And you'll notice that there is a little art arterial, a little capillary going in there. So this is where we're starting to filter the blood. So blood's coming in, it's under pressure, under blood pressure, and it's going to spill out fluid and ions and all kinds of garbage and whatever else is in there. And then that little capillary bed is going to leave, and we'll take a, we'll take a look at what happens with this part of the vasculature in a little bit. But here we have our, our renal corpuscle, so we know so far this is the very first part of, of the filtration that's happening here. So this is basically the gathering up part the receiving from, from the blood part. And then we're going to get into the tubule system. And you'll notice that we have this first part of the tubule system, and then we get down into this loop, and then we have this last part of the tubule system. Okay? If, it is the, if the tubule is the first part that is close to the renal corpuscle, we will call it proximal. It's proximal to the renal corpuscle. So this first part is the proximal convoluted tubule. Why do we use the word convoluted? Because look at the path it takes. It goes over here, goes down there, comes back up, goes to the left, goes back to the right. So it's all over the place. <laughs> it's convoluted. That's why. Then we have the nephron loop, also known as the loop of Henle. That's the dippy downy part right here. And then we have the distal part of our convolutions that we're going to call the distal convoluted tubule. Distal because it's the part of the tube that is furthest away from the renal corpuscle. And then our distal convoluted tubule is going to attach to a collection duct. And as you can see from all of these other little stubbed out 
parts coming off of this collecting duct, there's going to be more than one nephron that feeds into this collecting duct. This collecting duct is collecting urine from a lot of other nephrons. Right? The other thing that I want to point out right here is that we have the arcuate artery in the vein. Now, why would the artist include these, these arteries and veins here for us? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because the arcuate artery and vein run along the transition point between the cortex, the cortex would be up here, and the medulla down here. So here we've got it labeled. The cortex is anything above the arcuates. The medulla is anything below it. So when we look at what we have here, we can say that the majority of our nephron is in the cortex of our kidney, and it's uh, the nephron loop that drops a little bit down into the medulla. And of course, the collecting duct is going to penetrate the, the medulla. In fact, the collecting ducts will congregate and merge down at the tip of the pyramid, because this, this these are what's making up the renal pyramid. And where they all merge together, where all these collecting ducts merge together, it forms that renal papilla. So that's what's happening with that. Now there are two basic parts to the renal corpuscle. First of all, you've got the capillary, that special capillary known as the glomerulus. And I like to call it a capillary tuft because unlike uh, other capillaries where we studied uh, where it has an arterial end and then it merges, you know, kind of expands into all those little interconnected capillaries and then it, they all converge back and create a, a venule and so we have the venous in the capillary bed. That doesn't happen here. What happens here is that you have the arterial that feeds into the glomerulus and uh, then you have that little capillary tuft there um, and instead of it um, having a, a going from here to there it actually creates a loop so if we look at what the artist is trying to show us here is that we basically have a loop right here we've got another loop right here we've got a loop that's going but you know into the page here and another loop there and all these loops are going to converge and uh, create a, an arterial that's going to drain this little capillary bed. So that's an unusual feature here. The structure, this little looped structure, is basically a, a capillary. Okay, so that's that's a, a that's a little bit about the glomerulus. All right. So the fact that it's a capillary means that it's got a very thin wall and we know that anywhere it's going to be simple squamous epithelium and wherever we have that we're trying to move stuff across that wall efficiently and effectively. So the, it's going to be the, the more porous type of capillaries, the fenestrated capillaries, not the most porous, the sinusoidal, we're, we only find those in a couple of places in the body, but here we're going to have the fenestrated, um, a little bit more porous to allow for substances to, to spill out. Um, and that's going to allow for uh, the efficient filtration formation. Now what is filtrate? Filtrate is going to be plasma, so it's going to be that fluid from the from the blood, plasma, as well as any other products that can spill out. Now there's not a great deal of selection that happens here in the filtration process in the glomerulus. Pretty much the rule is, if you are a particle and you can slip through the cracks, then you get the invitation to enter into the nephron. And we're going to sort all that out later. So in the glomerulus, we're going to have a lot of stuff spilling out of the blood that we, we don't necessarily want to eliminate in urine. So there's going to be a mechanism by which we move all of that back into the bloodstream. But right here, it's the shotgun blast approach to filtering out um, stuff from the blood. And it's pretty much, there's, <laughs> once the blood reaches the glomerulus, there's this, there's this, this sign that says, <laughs> you know, slip out if you can anybody and everybody welcome and so anything small enough to slip through the cracks does and that's going to include fluid as well as many many pieces many uh, nutrients ions particles all kinds of stuff so we don't want this 
stuff that's spilling out of our glomerulus to go just anywhere. So there's actually going to be a covering around that to capture all of this fluid and whatever's in the fluid. And that's going to be a capsule. So there's a capsule that is uh, going to cover the, cover the glomerular tuft and capture whatever's spilling out of it. And we call this the glomerular capsule, and it's also known as the Bowman's capsule, named after the English anatomist um, Sir William Bowman, who discovered it. He actually discovered a bunch of stuff. Uh, but this is, as far as A&P students go, this is his claim to fame right here. So it's this cup-shaped structure made up of uh, squa simple squamous epithelium. All right, going to be a covering there. And it does have a parietal layer and it does have a visceral layer. And um, uh, and its job is basically to capture all this filtrate and then shuttle it into the tubule system. That's all it's doing. All right. Now, we talk a little bit about the parietal layer and, and um, the visceral layer. Remember, the, the parietal layer is going to be on the inside of the capsule. And then there's going to be a visceral membrane layer that's going to wrap around. It's actually going to cover the glomerulus. So very much like a mini version of what we learned about in any sort of a body cavity. That's getting replicated here. All right, so we've got a little a little filtration membrane that's anchored to the, the capsule wall, loops back around and covers up the glomerulus. So that is our visceral and our parietal layers. Uh, I said that the capsule wall is made up of squamous epithelium, so is this. Okay. Now on top of this are going to be these specialized cells known as podocytes. And these podocytes are kind of interesting because they have these very elaborate foot-like appendages that are going to cling to this, this membrane that goes around these capillaries, and they're going to act like filtration um, slits. So the way that these little these little processes with their little feathery like appendages coming off of the these processes, um, they're going to interweave and they're going to create another another component of filtration um, to the glomerular tuft. So let's think about this. So the glomerular tuft is made up of fenestrated uh, capillaries, which means that there's slightly larger holes, not the biggest holes we can have, not the smallest holes we can have, but you know, slightly larger hole because we wanna you know, get a bunch of stuff to spill out in out of the blood along with a bunch of fluid. All right, and then we're going to have this membrane um, that, that covers it. It's also going to have some openings in it. And then we got these podocytes with their little feet that are creating another layer, like a sieve, over this as well. So we've got multiple layers of, of, um, of, of sifting that can happen with particles. All right. So we are trying to minimize what can spill out of the blood while still allowing the necessary things to spill out of the blood. So what do we not want to spill out of the blood? Proteins, red blood cells, <laughs> that's that sort of stuff. We don't want that to spill out of the blood, all right? But we do want mo molecules to be able to spill out of the blood. Maybe not like big protein molecules, but you know, other molecules. Things like urea, uric acid, stuff like that. So here's our image. So let's take a look at what we've got going on here. So here we've got our arterial that's coming into our renal corpuscle. And we've got all these loops, these little loops of capillary looping around. And then they're eventually going to exit the corpuscle this way. And then here we can see the capsule, Bowman's capsule, all right, creating this little um, the area that's going to capture whatever's spilling out of the, the glomerulus. And then these little yellow things are going to be the podocytes. And the artist has done a nice job of showing you their little feathery-like um, appendages coming off their, their foot-like processes. And these, these are wrapped around the loops of the glomerular tuft. So that's our the whole filtration thing. And I suspect, let's see, are they trying to show, yeah. So there's going to be this parietal layer of the glomerulus, and then it's going to loop around, and it will create a visceral layer, and that is actually the visceral layer is what these podocytes are sitting on. 
And I'm going to point your attention to this right here. This is the very first part of the tubule system right there. So whatever spills out of this, this little capillary drops into this space here between the capillary, the glomerulus, and the uh, capsule wall. And then it will be shuttled into the first part of the tubule system, which is the proximal convoluted tubule. And I'd like to draw your attention to what sort of cells we have here making up the wall of our proximal convoluted tubule, and what sort of special feature do they have? Well, if you said you're looking at a, um, a cuboidal epithelial cell, you're correct. And as far as a special feature, if you're saying that you see villi, you are correct. And what's, what does the presence of villi tell us? That there's absorption going on. So whatever we spill out in here, it's shuttled first into this, this proximal convoluted tubule that's made up of cuboidal cells with a whole lot of microvilli, villi on them, I should say, villi. And so we know that a lot of what got spilled out, a lot of the maybe fluid, maybe some of the ions, maybe nutrients that made its way into our filtrate is going to be pulled out of that filtrate and entered back into the bloodstream. Now, I know we haven't talked about that yet, but I just wanted to point that out because we're going to talk about that. All right, let's talk about this tubule. So the tubule is only about an inch, inch and a quarter long, and it's going to consist of a single layer of epithelial cells. Most, mostly we're going to see cuboidal, but there's going to come a point where we actually get into um, simple squamous. And um, each region of our tubule system is going to have some unique histological characteristics because they're going to be doing different functions. So form follows function. Remember that. Now, we know that uh, we have three distinct parts to our renal tubule. We have the proximal convoluted tubule, which is the part closest to the renal corpuscle. And then we have the loop that dips down into the medulla, the only part of the, of the nephron that does. And then we have the distal convoluted tubule, the part that is part of the tubule that is furthest from the renal corpuscle, but is attached to the collecting duct, which is the last part. Now, we've already established that the proximal convoluted tubule is made up of cuboidal epithelial cells. And you might remember from AMP1 that whenever you see a cuboidal cell, you have to think, what's it doing? What's it making? What's it moving? Because that's what these cells do. Cuboidal cells um, are the cells that line many of our glands, like our sweat glands, uh, salivary glands, and they're making products or the other possibility is they're moving stuff around, which means they move something from one area, they put it inside themselves, and then they move it to another area. That's what I mean by they move it from one area to another. So that's exactly what these cells are doing. They don't necessarily make anything because they've got plenty of stuff to deal with <laughs> in that tubules and that we just filtered out of the blood. So they're not making something. It's not like glandular cells that are making products, but these are very active because they're going to be moving stuff um, from the filtrate back into the blood and maybe even receiving things from the blood and putting it into filtrate because that's a possibility too. And we'll look at how that's happening in just a bit. So cuboidal cells with a lot of... Um, villi, microvilli, creating that, that dense brush border. And we know that villi is all about absorption because it increases surface area. We're going to have a ton of mitochondria in these cells because of how busy these cells are moving stuff around. Because if, if the cell is having to use a, a, an ion pump, that takes energy. If the cell is having to create a vesicle to move things around, that creates energy. So these cells are going to have a lot of mitochondria in them. All right. So their job is basically to do what we call reabsorption and secretion. Now you might be wondering, well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is that one of these terms describes moving substances from the filtrate into the blood, and the other one describes moves, moving something from the blood into the filtrate. Now, how do we know which one is which? Well, the terms reabsorption and, and secretion are from the perspective of the bloodstream, not from the perspective of the nephron. So when something is being reabsorbed, it's being reabsorbed by the blood, which means that whatever the blood is, is reabsorbing has been moved out of the filtrate in the nephron tubule system. 
So when something is pulled out of filtrate and dropped back to it back into the bloodstream, that's called reabsorption. It's from the perspective of the bloodstream. Now what happens when the bloodstream decides that uh, it has something that it wants to release, didn't get filtered out in, over there in the renal corpuscle, but it does want to release this molecule, well then it has the opportunity to secrete that and the tubule will pick it up and drop it into the filtrate. That's called secretion. So when our tubules are adding stuff into the filtrate, that is called secretion because it was secreted from or released from the bloodstream, secreted from the bloodstream, and it gets picked up by the tubule system, dropped into the filtrate. All right. So remember that. I'll remind you, but try to remember it on your own as well. Our second part of our tubule system is known as the nephron loop, also known as the loop of Henle, named after this happy chap right here, Frederick Gustav Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt Henle. Okay, maybe not Jingleheimer Schmidt, but this guy right here. And uh, he was German, German anatomist. And this is that part that is going to descend down into the uh, renal pyramid in the medulla. And when we take a, a closer look at this, we're going to see that there is a difference between the descending limb of this loop and the ascending limb of this loop. The descending loop is going to be the proximal part of the loop and um, it's going to be doing a different function than the ascending loop. The, dis the descending loop is going to be made up of simple squamous epithelium, so when we take a look at it, we'll see that it's significantly thinner. We also call it the, the thin limb uh, or the thin descending limb. The ascending limb is going to be uh, made up of either cuboidal or columnar cells. So the fact that we're, we've got a different epithelial cell there tells us that something different is happening in this part of the loop. So sometimes we say descending and ascending portions of the loop. Sometimes we say the thick or the thin limbs of the loop. So um, yeah, and when we're looking at a picture, it'll make perfect sense in about two seconds. Now, in the distal convoluted tubule, we're going to revert back largely to cuboidal cells, but the thing is, is that these cuboidal cells aren't going to have a whole lot of microvilli. So that tells us that maybe there's not a whole lot of absorption going on. And it says right here that, in fact, we've got more secretion happening than reabsorption. So what does that mean? Secretion means that the blood is releasing something. It's being picked up at this end. So it's not that these cells are having to do a great deal of work on the filtrate because at this point there's already, by the time the filtrate has made it to these, to the distal convoluted tubules, it's already had a great deal of work being done on it. So we're fine tuning what's happening here in the distal convoluted tubule as far as the movement of, of stuff in and out of it. Right. This portion is uh, like the proximal convoluted tubule is going to be found only in the cortex of the kidney. Now this is a little bit more information than my Bio 1300 students need to know, but I'm going to go ahead and leave it in here because I'm going to refer to it in a little bit. So in the collecting ducts, we're going to have two cells that are going to play a big role here. We've got the principal cells, which are going to help maintain water and sodium balance. They're going to play a role in that. And then we're going to have these intercalated cells, um, which is cuboid cells that have a whole lot of microvilli on them. And there's a couple of different ones of those that are going to um, help maintain acid-base balance. So um, I'm actually going to refer to the principal cells um, in a little bit when we start talking about the movement of, of particles uh, around uh, under the influence of um, hormones. So keep that principal cell in mind. Now the collecting duct, like I said, is going to be receiving uh, filtrate from a number of different nephrons. Uh, and it's going to run through the medullary pyramids. And in fact, it's all these little uh, collecting ducts going through the pyramids that give the pyramid a striated appearance. Right? At the, at the uh, apex of that uh, pyramid, where we have the, the renal papilla is where we see all of these different collecting ducts merging so that it can so that the filtrate can leave through one opening in that renal pyramid and drain the filtrate into a minor calyx. 
Because remember the minor calyx is located at the tip of each one of these renal pyramids. Now we've looked at a couple of pictures of nephrons and I've only shown you one of the two possibilities here. I've shown you the cortical nephron. The cortical nephron which is going to be most of the nephrons that we see in the kidney and what we notice about the cortical nephron is that the majority of its structure is located in the cortex. Now there's a second type of a nephron called a juxtamedullary nephron and what makes this one different than the cortical is that it has a super duper long loop of Henle. So it has a super duper long loop that dips way down into the medulla. Now you might be thinking well gee are those limbs this similar? Is there a thin segment? Is there a thick segment? Yeah actually it's the same it's just that it ends up being super duper long and each of the limbs is doing some is doing basically the same stuff except it provides uh, the longer passageway provides a longer time to do what that part of the nephron is doing. And in the case of the juxtamedullary nephron we can generally say that what's happening here is that the filtrate that's running through a juxtamedullary ne nephron is going to be um, a more concentrated version of our, our filtrate. So we're making concentrated urine in these guys whereas the other ones are making a more dilute um, a, a more dilute urine. All right, let's take a look at what we've got here. Now we've seen a structure that's very similar to this nephron on the left. This is our cortical nephron. And so we see our renal corpuscle and our proximal convoluted tubule, and then our loop, and then our distal convoluted tubule, and then um, our collecting duct. Now on the right, you'll, you'll see the uh, juxtamedullary nephron. So it's going to have a corpuscle, a proximal convoluted tubule, but look at this super duper long loop of Henle. And then we have a distal convoluted tubule. All right. Now in this image, the, the artist is showing us this special vasculature that wraps around the loop of Henle and it's called a vasa recta. Now you might be inclined to think that there's only a vasa recta around this super duper long loop here in the juxtamedullary nephron. That's not the case. We actually will have a vasa recta over here as well. They just didn't include the image here likely because they wanted to include some labels just like they they included this peritubular capillary network around the proximal convoluted tubules here in the cortical nephron but they didn't over here. So what am I trying to tell you with this? What I'm telling you is that there's going to be vasculature around the, the, the tubule system whether it's cortex or medulla and whether it is a cortical nephron or whether it is a juxtamedullary nephron. There is going to be vasculature associated with the entirety of this nephron. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So don't let the, the picture fool you. Um, the absence or presence of the purple vasculature isn't indicative of real life. It's just, the artist just has to show you in, in, in a particular way and this is how it, it's being shown. So there's peritubular capillaries around the tubule system. There's vasa recta around both of the loops of Henle, whether it's cortical uh, nephron or juxtamedullary nephron. Now we've already talked about all of these terms here, glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, tubular secretion, but we're going to go ahead and redefine them here um, again. So there's three processes that are involved in the formation of urine and it's these three processes right here. First one is that glomerular filtration. So this is when blood comes into that glomerular tuft, the fluid and ions and macromolecules all spill out, whatever can spill out does and enters into, it's held in place by that capsule and fed into the proximal convoluted tubule. That is filtration. Ideally we are making cell free filtrate and protein free filtrate because those are big structures. Proteins are, you might remember, big structures and our red blood cells, white blood cells, those are big structures. We don't want those things slipping out. If we start to see blood in our filtrate, urine, I mean a uh, protein in our filtrate. We need to be concerned about what is happening with that poor little glomerulus. Is it damaged or not? Because if those things are if those things are spilling out into our filtrate, then that tells us that we've lost some integrity in our glomerulus. 
All right. So the first the first step in forming urine is to do the filtration. That happens in the glomerulus within the renal corpuscle. All right. Now we've already talked about the terms reabsorption and secretion. Whether we put the word tubular in front of it or not, it's still from the perspective of the bloodstream. So when we say tubular secretion, we're talking about what gets released from the bloodstream. When we say tubular reabsorption, we're talking about what's getting reabsorbed into the bloodstream. Uh, re reabsorbed from the filtrate back into the bloodstream. Secretion from the bloodstream being dropped into filtrate. All right. Now here's the thing about the reabsorption business. Remember the cells that had all of the microvilli, the proximal convoluted uh, tubule cells? This is going to return about 90% of the substances that got spilled out in the filtrate in the glomerulus is going to return that back into the blood. So almost everything that got spilled out in the renal corpuscle through filtration is going to be reabsorbed and put back into a, the bloodstream, into one of those peritubular capillaries that's kind of winding its way around the tubule system. So then you might be thinking, well, what kind of stuff is spilling out that we got to return that much to it? Glucose, a lot of our ions, things like calcium, maybe even sodium, water. I know that's a nutrient, but it, you know, there's a lot of stuff that got spilled out over there in the renal corpuscle. And so we're going to return a lot of that back to the blood right off the bat. Now, the renal secretion is going to be a more selective process. This is when we're selectively moving stuff out of the blood and putting it into filtrate. So if we look at each one of these processes, the glomerular filtration is truly a shotgun blast approach. It's just like whatever can come out of the end of that barrel, just blammo, there it goes. Anything and everything. And then when we move it, it we, move, we move that filtrate into the proximal convoluted tubule, we're moving it with big sweeping motions, moving that stuff with big sweeping motions back into the bloodstream. So first thing was like a huge shotgun blast. Now we can think about like taking a, a broom or your hand and starting to sweep stuff back in. It's a little bit more selective. When we're going to go through the tubule system, like down to the loops, it's a little more selective. Now, we haven't talked about what's happening in the tubules, uh, excuse me, into the loop, but it's a more selective process where we're going to allow this classification of molecule to move out, but not this one. And then uh, on the other side of the loop, a different classification of molecule to move out. And by the time we get into the distal convoluted tubule, it says here selective mo movements. And that's indeed what it is. We can almost think about moving this particle or that particle as opposed to like a big sweeping motion with your hand. So we start off at the renal corpuscle with huge motions and we continue to taper the movement of particles down until we, we're, we're fine tuning it in the distal convoluted tubule and to some degree even in the collecting duct. Glomerular filtration is a passive process. It doesn't require the use of ATP to do filtration. So what's happening in the renal corpuscle doesn't require any energy. The, the, the energy that is fueling that is actually blood pressure. And in order to understand that, we have to understand what filtration is. Filtration is the movement of particles under pressure. So think about your coffee maker sitting on your kitchen counter. You pour your water in, and then it has to go through the, the filter, go through the coffee, go through the filter, and then you end up with your pot of coffee. And you might be thinking, well, that looks pretty passive to me, Dr. O. Well, it's not entirely passive because on planet Earth we have something called gravity. And gravity is creating the pressure. It's a pool, maybe not, you know, as big of a pressure as, you know, an atmospheric type pressure, but it, it creates the pool that pulls the uh, the water through the filtration system. So that is that's how that's that's happening. All right. So we, 
on planet Earth, we use gravity. In the kidneys, we're using um, the, the blood pressure in order to create the pressure needed to perform the filtration. But it's largely a passive process. We don't have to expend any ATP within the nephron or the kidney anywhere to make that happen. Now, whenever we're moving fluids around, we always have to think in terms of hydrostatic pressure. And we might remember that hydrostatic pressure is the pressure that fluid is going to exert on the wall of its container. So we're going to have a couple of different hydrostatic pressures to take into consideration when we look at what's happening here. So if we follow the blood into the renal corpuscle, we're going to have um, we're going to have the hydrostatic pressure of the blood inside the capillary. That's going to be one of our hydrostatic pressures. But then we're going to have all the stuff that filtered out of the cap of the glomerulus is now going to be in the capsule. So that fluid will also be putting pressure on the glomerulus, but from the outside. So there's going to be a hydrostatic pressure there too. So we'll take a look at that when we start figuring out what's creating um, the glomerular filtration rate. But hydrostatic pressure is going to be one of those things we have to take into consideration. All right. Um, the solids are going to be moving through that filtration membrane. We already talked about that. Filtration membrane is going to be made up of the wall of the glomerular capillary as well as that covering uh, that goes over the capillary and the little podocytes with their little slit-like feet. So that's the filtration membrane. Now, unlike the other capillary beds that we've studied, there's not going to be any reabsorption happening here. So what do I mean by that? I mean that when we looked at the capillary in the, blood, in the cardiovascular system, we had an arterial end. And we talked about how the pressure of the blood coming in at the arterial end is going to force stuff out of the blood out of the blood vessel, out of the capillary, so that these things can get into the tissues, things like fluid, ions, glucose, oxygen. But that at the venous side of our capillary bed, we have to have a mechanism to pull stuff back in. This is what we learned about capillary beds out in the body. Only part of that story is true here, because in the glomerulus, we don't have our true venous end. All we have is a one-way system out. We're doing filtration. We don't want to be sucking anything back in. We want it to go out and stay out. So there's not going to be any reabsorption that happens in the glomerulus. So everything is, the whole idea is to spill it out and then leave it there. Don't bring anything in. Now, I just talked a little bit about the filtration membrane on the previous slide. This is a, a membrane that is between the, um, the blood and the interior of the capsule. So this is that membrane that lays on top of the glomerulus, the little capillary tuft, and the capsule wall. And it's going to be porous. It's a basement membrane of sorts, and, but it's going to be porous. And its job is to allow fluid and solutes to slip out. That's what its job is. And as long as it's intact, that's what it does. But when we start to see things like red blood cells, protein molecules in our filtrate, then we get a little bit concerned about what's happening in the glomerulus. What's happening in our filtration unit that's allowing these big particles out because they're not supposed to be there. Now, there's three layers to this filtration membrane. I just talked about these. Um, there is the wall of the glomerular tuft, little glomerular capillary, because that's, remember, that's made up of fenestrated epithelium. So it's, you know, that middle grade porous uh, capillary allows bigger stuff to come through. And then we got that basement membrane, that, that, that uh, visceral layer that covers the outside of our glomerulus, the outside of our capillary tuft. And then we got the podocytes with their little feathery feet. That's what makes up our filtration membrane. So particles that are capable of getting through all three of those get to enter into the filtrate, and a lot of particles do. So there is some selectivity here, but not a great deal. Largely, all three of these layers are designed to keep in big stuff, the red blood cells. 
the uh, the protein, um, the plasma proteins, things like that. Slightly different image of our renal corpuscle. Uh, I like this one because it actually shows the loops a little more clearly. So here we have the arterial that is feeding our renal corpuscle, and we can see that this we've got a, a clear loop being created. So we have uh, the filtration happening through these loops and all these loops will merge and then exit by way of this arterial. So there's definitely a, a, a one, an in and an out. And remember, everything that's coming through these loops, the, the force is outward. There's not gonna be anything allowing the, the backward draw of, of things back into this, uh, this, this, this capillary right here. Now, anything that spills out of these, these little loops has to make its way through the wall of the capillary, through the basement membrane, that's basically the capsule wall that has looped back around and is now on top of all of these little capillary loops, and then, on to, and then past these podocytes that are on top of that membrane that's on top of the loops. So anything that makes it out of those three layers is going to end up in this region here in the capsule. And then eventually it's going to make its way into the proximal convoluted tubule. So this is a great uh, microscopic view of uh, those podocytes as they're wrapped around the, the tufts of the, cat, of the glomerulus. So here's a cell and here's one of its processes and coming off the processes you can see these little feathery um, extensions that are creating that sieve like effect so this guy has you know is, is kind of you know got all these processes there's probably a cell on the other side of this there's a tubule in there a little uh, component of the not the tubule system but a component of the capillary right here um, that this is surrounding and there's probably another one of these guys on the other side of that that this guy is merging its little processes with to create that sieve like um, quality so here we can see that happening between this process and this process right there now as we've already said the whole purpose of this filtration membrane is to cause the macromolecules to stay into the bloodstream while allowing um, smaller particles to move through. Macromolecules meaning like our red blood cells or our uh, big clunky proteins, things like that. It is possible that these could be, some of these could get stuck, like they might be somewhere in between, you know, too, 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 uh, too big to um, really make it all the way through, but small enough to like start the process to get through. So it is possible that things can get stuck there. But the whole purpose of this filtration membrane is to allow things like water, glucose, amino acids. Amino acids are pretty big molecules, right? remember that. Uh, nitrogenous waste, things like uh, urea uh, and even uric acid uh, to come through and uh, uh, hopefully to end up, uh, some of these to end up in, in filtrate. Now the plasma proteins are too big to slip out of uh, or, or through the, the filtration membrane. But we want our plasma proteins to stay in the blood because they're, they, they've got to create an osmotic draw, which means that we need them elsewhere in the body to create that, that pull in the venous end of other capillary beds, not found here in the kidneys, but other capillary beds that are going to draw fluid back in. So the things that we learned about when we looked at the blood vessels and, and the capillaries in the cardiovascular system. Because we know that one of the, one of the important things that the, the plasma proteins are doing for us is preventing the loss of all the water into the capillary beds. So that's, that's important. It's just not that important here in the, in the kidney. So let's talk about the pressures that are actually involved in creating filtration and ultimately creating filtrate. So we're going to have an outward pressure and we're, we're from the perspective of being within our glomerular tuft. We're in the we're inside of the glomerulus. So that's what we're defining as an outward pressure. What's going to force uh, fluid and particles out of the glomerular tuft? Uh, well one of those is going to be the hydrostatic pressure within the glomerular tuft, within the glomerular capillary. So that's a big one. And in fact, it is the chief source of pressure pushing water and solutes out of the blood. 
because remember this this blood is entering into this glomerular capillary bed under pressure and that's going to create this pressure this, this hydrostatic pressure that's going to cause stuff to spill out now this pressure is rather high. It comes in at 55 millimeters of mercury, which is considerably higher than what we saw in capillary beds out in the tissue. The, the, the outward force of hydrostatic pressure there enters into the capillary bed from the arterial side of things at only 26 millimeters of mercury. That's a huge difference. All right. Now, the reason that we're able to maintain a high pressure like this in the glomerulus has to do with the difference in diameter of the vessel that is feeding it versus the vessel that is draining it. Now, I didn't point this out in, a, in the image when we looked at it, but we will when we take a look at another picture. I'm going to point that out to you, the difference in the diameter of the, of the vessels that are feeding and draining this capillary bed. And then it'll make sense why we have this higher pressure it's because it's because when we enter into like in a regular capillary bed when we enter into the system we immediately lose a lot of pressure because of uh, all the the branching of the capillary bed for one thing but on the venous side of things we've got something countering um, what's happening within the capillary bed we have that osmotic draw on the venous side of things and that basically allows us to lose some of the pressure on the arterial side of our capillary bed but we don't have that that osmotic draw happening in the glomerulus which is why we're a and then plus we have the the vessel draining it also being a small pressure being a small diameter and that helps us to maintain this pretty high pressure but we need that high pressure in order to do true filtration all right let's go ahead and fill in the gaps here so here we have the vessel that is feeding this capillary bed this is the afferent arterial that is feeding this capillary bed and we know about the loops we know about the podocytes and then we have this vessel that is draining it and there's two things I want to point out here it's called the efferent arterial number one and the second thing is it's an arterial now capillary beds we learned were drained by um, were fed by an afferent arterial but then they were drained by a venule in the kidney our glomerular tuft, which is a capillary bed, is not drained by a venule. It's the only capillary bed in the body that is both fed and drained by an arterial. Now the way we can tell the difference between an afferent arterial and an efferent arterial is through the diameter. So let's think about this. When blood's coming in through the afferent arterial, we've got a lot of blood, a lot of fluid, a lot of particles all coming in here. And then we're doing filtration, which means we're spilling out fluid, we're spilling out particles, which means that whatever is leaving this, this glomerular tuft is going to have less volume. But we want to maintain pressure. So we restrict the diameter of the exiting vessel. And the size of this efferent arterial helps us maintain pressure, not only in the glomerulus for the purpose of filtration, but also in the afferent arterial, because this is in communication with the larger body, and we don't want to lose blood pressure just because we're feeding blood into the kidney for filtration. So this whole mechanism is important, and not only maintaining the pressure in here to do filtration, but in order to maintain pressure throughout the body we don't want pressure to drop off significantly in here because we could be losing pressure out in the body as a result of that. So we just got through talking about the big outward pressure, the hydrostatic pressure that's from within the glomerular tuft. What is opposing it? Because there's going to be something that's opposing it. So these are going to be our inward pressures. Now one of the inward pressures, I kind of talked about this a few slides ago, was uh, the effect that the fluid, once it leaves the glomerulus and is now in the, the capsule space, that's going to exert a pressure against the glomerular wall as well. So this is going to be one of the, the uh, inward forces. So this is going to be the hydrostatic pressure in the capsular space. 
So once the fluid leaves inside of our glomerular tuft, makes its way into the space in the, in the uh, renal corpuscle between the capsule wall and the wall of the glomerulus, now it's going to put some pressure back against that glomerular wall, and it's going to oppose the outward force, the hydrostatic pressure due to what's happening within the glomerular capsule, the, gl the glomerular capillary. Now, there's not a lot of pressure here, but it's enough, and we need to consider it. So the, the fluid pressure against the wall of the glomerulus from within the capsule, outside the glomerulus, is going to be about 15 millimeters of mercury. Now, remember, we started out with 55 millimeters of mercury, so this will drop it down to about 40 millimeters of mercury. But this is not the only inward force. Now, even though we don't have... Uh, an, an overall inward force, like uh, in this capillary bed, like we do in other capillary beds where, you know, we've spilled out enough fluid and we've lost enough pressure coming in from the arterial aspect of the capillary bed. And now we have our osmotic draw over in the venous side of the capillary bed. Remember, we don't really have that happening here. But we still have those plasma proteins and red, mo red blood vessels that are still remaining in our blood. So there's going to be a little bit of an osmotic draw that gets created, just not enough to actually cause any substances to be moved back inside of the glomerular capillary. So we do have to take into account our osmotic pressure that's created by the, the plasma protein staying inside of the glomerulus, and that comes in at about 30 millimeters of mercury. So you can see this is significantly less than our 55 millimeters of mercury coming in. So 55 millimeters of mercury pushing us out. And by the time a lot of stuff has spilled out of the glomerulus and into the capsular space, we now have an osmotic draw that we're creating that comes to about 30 millimeters of mercury. Now this is a lot more than what we see in our regular capillary beds out in the tissues. Because usually the osmotic draw, the osmotic pressure in our, our tissue capillary beds comes in at about 17 millimeters of mercury. So this is actually twice what, about what we would see, but it's still not enough to overcome the outward force of the filtration uh, forces at play here. So when we take into consideration the single outward force plus the inward forces, we get what's called our net filtration pressure. So what we do is we take our one outward force, which is 55 millimeters of mercury. This is the force of the blood as it comes into the, the glomerulus. And we're going to minus our hydrostatic pressure of the fluid once it enters into the capsular space. That's 15 millimeters of mercury. That brings us down to 40. And then we're going to subtract the osmotic pressure within the capillary. That's also an inward force. That comes in at 30. And that's going to leave us with a total outward force of 10 millimeters of mercury. So this 45 comes by adding 15 and 30, our inward forces, and subtracting that from 55 for a net filtration of 10. Now that doesn't seem like <coughs> a ton of pressure, but it's enough. It's enough for us to do what we need to do. So this is the pressure responsible for creating filtrate that our tubule is going to ultimately turn into urine. So in this image, I've given you a breakdown of what we just talked about. So we have one outward force acting to force fluid and particles out of the capillary, out of the glomerular capillary bed, and that is our hydrostatic pressure of the glomerular capillary, that's 55 millimeters of mercury, and then we have two inward forces. One is the osmotic pressure of the glomerular capillary, and this is due to the plasma protein staying behind as we're losing fluid and other filtrates into the capsular space. That comes in at 30 millimeters of mercury, not enough to overcome the 55 that's still forcing stuff out. But there it is. We have to take it into consideration. And then once the fluid spills out of the glomerulus and makes its way into the capsular space, then we have to consider the pressure that it exerts against the glomerular wall. And that comes in at significantly less, about 15 millimeters of mercury. So this is, this is how we come up with that 10. 10 millimeters of mercury creating our glomerular filtration pressure, which is going to lead to our uh, creating the glomerular filtration rate. Now, as with any rate, it's going to be the amount of something given a particular amount of time. So glomerular filtration rate is going to be the volume of filtrate that we create in about a minute. 
And so a normal level of uh, glomerular filtration rate is going to be about 120 to 125 milliliters per minute. That's how much filtrate we create per minute, about 125 milliliters per minute. All right. Now, glomerular filtration rate is going to be directly proportional to that pressure that we just talked about, the one, the one pressure out and the two pressures in. And there's some other things that can influence our glomerular filtration rate as well. So one of these is the total surface area available for filtration. Now, you might be thinking, well, okay, if that's an influence, then does that mean it can change? And the answer is, yeah, it can actually change. So there are some special cells in the glomerula, uh, in the glomerulus, in the wall of the glomerulus, that can contract and reduce the surface area of the glomerular capillary. And wherever you have less surface area, you're going to have less space for things to move across. So by reducing the surface area through a contraction of the walls of the capillary, you can actually reduce the total surface area available for filtration, and that can have an effect on our glomerular filtration rate, because if you don't have the surface area to move stuff across, then you're going to move less stuff across. So greater surface area to move stuff across, you're going to have a greater filtration rate, and if you uh, shrink that surface area, then you'll have less, a lower gl glomerular filtration rate. The other thing it has to do with the integrity of that filtration membrane. So um, the filtration membrane shouldn't change over time. Uh, it should be actually a um, static structure, but um, it could change, and that can uh, play a role if your glomerular filtration rate starts to alter over time. Like if you have your blood, have you if you have things tested one year, and then the following year um, it starts to go up, glomerular filtration um, rate starts to go up. Then you have to look at things like what's the integrity of the of the filtration membrane. Now I don't usually like to end uh, one of these lectures in the middle of a section but this is about a three hour long lecture so I am going to go ahead and cut it off at this point so be sure to watch part two where I actually get into the specifics of uh, autoregulation and then the, the neural and hormonal regulation.